So for those that didn't know, I did a video on the biggest land mammal to ever live, the Paraceratherium. But what I said might or might not have been true, all thanks to one massive elephant. Mammals seem to have a reputation on land for not being all that big when compared to other prehistoric animals like dinosaurs. And this is actually due to the fact that we are very dense. Now if a mammal was to reach the length or height of say a sauropod, it would be crushed under its own weight. With mammals that do get that big, such as whales, only doing so by a living life supported by water. So what we're about to take a look at is quite possibly the limit of how big a mammal can get on land. Many species of this elephant have been described, but they were actually initially described as members of the genus Elephus, which includes today's Asian elephants. It was then designated into a subgenus in 1924 of Loxodon, or African elephants, but eventually it was assigned its own genus, Paleoloxodon, with papers from the 2010s showing that this confusion may have stemmed from heavy hybridization between lots of different species of Paleoloxodon and other genera leading to a DNA analysis showing that today's African forest elephant is actually more closely related to Paleoloxodon than it is to today's African bush elephant. So in short, Paleoloxodon is considered its own genus, but if I was to describe the whole genus, it would sound like I'm describing about 10 different elephants. So I'm just gonna cover the extremes, how they got there, and the controversies. At a glance, Paleoloxodon didn't appear all too different to many other elephants, both modern and extinct. The main difference with this behemoth slash dwarf was its far more straight tusks and strangely bulbous crown. The tusks were actually much larger proportionally to the rest of the body, making the tusks of the largest species the longest tusks of any animal in Earth's history that we know of. This bulbous crown is also thought to have had something to do with this as well, since it served as attachment points for many muscles that supported the head. Which makes sense when you consider how much strength and power it would take just to make that head and those tusks functional. Speaking of size, this is also the part that not only ranges hugely, but has also caused the main amount of controversies when it comes to the size of this genus, especially when comparing it to Paraceratherium. The oldest species from which all others descended from was Paleoloxodon reci from Africa, which lived from the late Pliocene to the mid Pleistocene, and is thought to have grown to around 4.27 meters or 14 feet tall at the shoulders, and just over 12 tons still coming in at just below most weight estimates of Paraceratherium of 15 to 20 tons. And things got really interesting when this species decided to expand and diversify. As Paleoloxodon spread out from Africa across all of Eurasia around 800,000 years ago, the variety in sizes truly began. Many species became subjected to insular dwarfism, existing on smaller islands throughout the Mediterranean areas with less resources becoming not much larger than a metre in height. But then we look at the Asian species on the mainland, the two main ones we see being P. antiquus and P. nomadicus. P. antiquus grew in size for sure by hitting around 15 tonnes, but this is still on the lower end next to Paraceratherium, and it's also ironically thought to have been the one to give rise to most of the dwarf species. P. nomadicus, however, is where this discussion truly begins. Only fragmentary limb bones of this species is known, first specimen of which gave estimates of around 4.35 metres or 14.3 feet tall at the shoulder and around 13 tonnes. But another femur showing a size increase of 20% gave estimates of a shoulder height of 5.2 metres or 17.1 feet and a total weight of 22 tonnes. Now, does this make Paleoloxodon the biggest land mammal of all time? Well, on one hand, elephants today vary massively in their size, and if the same was true for Paleoloxodon, this guy might have even gotten bigger than 22 tons on rare occasions. But on the other hand, the 22 ton estimate was made in 2015 by Asia Laramendi, based on a publication from all the way back in 1834, of which he didn't actually have access to the original specimen, so actually went on record as saying that these estimates should be taken with a pinch of salt. More recent studies from 2023 saw Laramendi work with Gregory S. Paul, as well as other studies from this year, and these have pushed down this estimate down to an average range of 13 to 19 tons in weight, meaning that Paleoloxodon falls within the same size estimates as Paraceratherium. In short, without a time machine and some seriously big scales, we'll probably never know which one got bigger on average, or which one had the biggest maximum size. 
But another point I've stressed on this channel many times before is that bigger isn't always better. Paleo Loxodon likely spent its days in a similar way to modern elephants, spending most of its time grazing insane amounts of calories to uphold these gigantic sizes. However, as late as a potential 24,000 years ago, we see the last specimens of the giant Paleoloxodon species, coinciding with the change in environments thanks to the temperature changes of the last glacial period. This meant that whilst Paleoloxodon's food sources were still available, they simply weren't abundant enough to sustain a population of such a big animal. Now, some have speculated that human interaction may have played a role, since they were one of the few animals with evidence of successfully hunting a P. antiquus. But this isn't exactly confirming it for all other species, since us interacting with P. nemidicus is yet to be confirmed. So discussion time where you now have the opportunity to tell me whether you think things are just too unsure for Paraceratherium to be knocked off its pedestal, or if Paleoloxodon just knocks it out of the park. And whilst you're doing that, I'm going to answer today's question, which comes from... Kekwing... Kekwing of... Kekwing or 252. Probably butchered that. Uh, who's asked... Hi Ryan, I have a few questions about the Mesozoic era, mainly about vegetation. What were the landscapes of the Mesozoic era like, and what did it look like? What type of prehistoric plants, flowers, and trees flourished during the Mesozoic era when dinosaurs roamed Earth? What plants did dinosaurs eat? And do any prehistoric plants that coexist with dinosaurs still exist today? Okay, so this is quite a big question when you're asking about the whole Mesozoic era because plant life saw multiple massive changes. So I'm just going to take you really briefly through each period uh, and just explain what was around. Uh, also in terms of what plants the dinosaurs ate, it really depends on what one we're talking about. So check out the Paleo Profiles playlist that I've got on my channel where I would explain what kind of vegetation each individual dinosaur would have eaten. And also when it comes to these groups that I'm going to mention, most of them are still around today. So many modern environments are used as analogues for past ones, but you still need to use your imagination a little. For example, grass not being a thing until long after the non-aving dinosaurs went extinct. But you'll notice things get more familiar as time goes on. During the Triassic, there wasn't a huge amount of variability in terrestrial plant life thanks to the land masses being combined into one supercontinent, Pangaea. This meant that most of the inland portions were a lot drier, and so most of Earth's plant life lived more towards the perimeter of the supercontinent, with a single stark contrast between the north and the south. In the northern hemisphere, in what is dubbed Laurasia, you had many forests and swamps that were dominated by conifers, ginkgos, benicitales, and cycads, while Gondwana in the southern hemisphere had mostly dichroidium and thinfeldia. Again, both of these hemispheres had plant life that thinned out the further inland you got, since you had to walk a pretty long way before you came across any large body of water again. When we get to the Jurassic, we see Pangaea start to break up, meaning that moist ocean air can get into more of the nooks and crannies of the continents. Given the more even spread, both hemispheres gave way to mostly conifer, fern, horsetail and cycad vegetations, and any open plains, floodplains and savannas not looking too dissimilar from today, but again replacing grass with low-lying cycads and conifers etc. The Cretaceous is when things look the most familiar. Much of the same plant life that I had just mentioned was still around as the continents moved closer to their current positions, but the much higher sea levels saw quite a few more islands and archipelagos, making most of these small land masses look very similar to Caribbean islands. The main similarity though, and one of the most important innovations in flora's history, was the dawn of angiosperms, or in layman's terms, flowering and fruit plants. Flowers and fruits have one main purpose, being as appealing as possible to animals so that when they're fed upon, the seeds they're carrying can travel much further than the plant can carry by itself. Thanks to this, angiosperm plants spread and diversified rapidly worldwide, with the late Cretaceous finishing by not looking too dissimilar to most of the hotter climates of today. Okay, that was a longer answer than usual, just because of the scope of the question. In fact, I think that subject could use a video all by itself. But that's the general gist of things, so I hope that helps. Anyway, thank you for submitting that, and thank you to everyone else for watching this far. Please consider liking and subscribing if you haven't already, and I will catch you guys next time.